there, podcast listener. You are listening to What Scares Us, a podcast from the Ann Arbor District Library in Michigan, where four friends share the movies that take us beyond the fragile geometry of space, where nothing is as it seems, only to pop up and say, I wouldn't go in there for a couple of minutes if I were you. (laughs) I'm Christopher. And I'm joined by three other staff members of the library. To my right, we have... Amanda. I'm Allison. And I'm Matt. And today we're talking about the movie Don't Look Now from 1973. In a... Summary statement, this movie is about grief and a couple that face the death of their daughter. It's adapted from a short story by Daphne du Maurier. The movie is directed by Nicholas Rogue, who also did The Man Who Fell to Earth. The cinematographer is Anthony Richmond, who did all the footage for Let It Be, the Beatles movie, and also Candyman. The editor is Graham Clifford, who worked on Twin Peaks and Rocky Horror Picture Show. The music is by Pino Donaggio, who wrote the Dusty Springfield hit, You Don't Have to Say You Love Me, and also worked with Brian De Palma and Dario Argento on movies like Carrie and Piranha. So, that all being said, what does everyone think, and is this the first time you've watched the movie? This is the first time I've seen this movie. Um, it has been on a list for me for a long time to get around to. I've I've heard of its influence on a bunch of different filmmakers that I really like, and but I just somehow never uh, got around to seeing it. Funny story, not to jump way the fuck ahead, mm-hmm. but I've seen the image from the reveal at the end oh. of the movie enough times that I started to kind of figure out what was happening once they kind of got into that corner. So in that sense, it was already kind of spoiled for me. That's a bummer. It, well, it didn't lessen the effect of that, though. Um, okay. But yeah, this was the first time that I saw it, and uh, obviously we'll get into this, but I feel like I need to see it maybe three or four more times to catch all the little nooks and crannies and fun little things in there that, to me, I thought were like, this is this, these are weird editing choices. <laughs> Well, there are a lot of little tiny references through the whole movie, and I feel like you've all trained me so well to pay attention, Becker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, starting with the first As we movie. all say. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, this is my second time seeing the movie. I watched it once a couple of years ago, and again, it's on all the lists of like horror movies you have to watch. Um, and I loved it the first time. I, When I'm reading or trying to catch up on seeing horror movies I haven't seen or that I should have already seen. And I don't like to read what they are about. And I'm glad I didn't for this one. And I just went in blind and I was, I was just blown away. I I think I was in the right mood at the moment to watch something that was a little darker or weirder or complex and just mysterious. And I really enjoyed it. And it's not one I want to rewatch all the time. And I rewatched it again this past week, getting ready for this recording today. And it was great to go back. And even on the first watch, you're immediately trained to like look for things. Cause as Christopher just said, for this one, it's really like apparent that, you're, that you should be looking for things because there are so many repeating motifs and you want to know when things are going to pop up again and where you saw them. So I, I was thrilled that Christopher picked this. This was this has been actually on my short list for all of the, the movies I've picked for this show. This was always like oh. my runner up. Hmm. So Christopher picked it. So it does not have to be my runner up for my next nice. pick. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to hear everybody's thoughts on this movie today. Nice. I've seen it once before. I watched it for the first time last year. It was on one of those like 101 best horror movie moments lists or something like that. It's so on so I, many of those lists. Yeah, and I think I think the ending was also kind of ruined. F- not ruined, but I knew that um, the red cloak was someone that... Uh, it was someone else. <laughs> that weird little goblin lady? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I also watched this uh, just a couple of days ago, but it was the same day that my parents landed in Venice. They're going to Italy for the first time. Oh, wow. Which um, mm-hmm. I kind of wish I didn't. My husband had to be like, well, let's not read too much into this. Because <laughs> I was like, 
they're sending me pictures on the family group chat as I'm watching this movie with like a lot of the same imagery. It's like, well, I'm not gonna think about this. Were they there well, to restore a church? <laughs> yes, they are. Well, to Allison, you and your siblings are all alive. They're not there as a retreat to get over anything. So that's true. I did text them. I'm your new mom for the next three weeks. <laughs> Be safe on the canals. Don't go in any tunnels. Do not follow anybody dressed in red. Right. Do not wear red at all. <laughs> I love this movie. I think it's really great. I am glad that I didn't see it before I watched Hereditary because I think it would have um, killed that movie for me. But yeah, I really enjoyed it and I am looking forward to talking about it today. Wonderful. <laughs> well, let's jump into the first scene of the movie. Well, before we do that, yeah. what's your experience with this movie? I had seen it once before and really enjoyed it. And I, I always remember the end scene, less the reveal than just that weird, frantic feeling of being lost in Venice. Mm -hmm. And I did get to go to Venice last summer. Nice. Oh. And I recognized some of the places in the movie, which cool. is really fun. Oh. Um, but of course, it was a much different experience because when I was there, it was mobbed with tourists. And in the movie, also not the seventies. It was also not, <laughs> not the also 70s. not almost winter. <laughs> my, and my mustache isn't as good as oh uh, sure oh, as no. Donald Sutherland. Oh. Sure, another great mustache of the podcast. <laughs> yes, I beg to differ. <laughs> Got some thoughts about that later. <laughs> well, the movie opens, and right away we get this amazing 70s look to film that we've mm -hmm. talked about and alluded to on the show before. Man, uh, it's it's really kind of hard to put your finger on, but it is such a 70s look, and you already know what kind of creepy feeling you might be in for watching this. So we see uh, John and Laura, Christine and Johnny the Sun. This is the family. John is played by Donald Sutherland. Laura is played by Julie Christie. And their two kids are out playing. And the editing here is one of the best parts of the whole movie, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. We constantly see the actions by the kids are being mirrored by the adults and back and forth. Um, it's, it's a fantastic opening shot. The music here is this playful, very innocent piano piece that's not very polished. It sounds like an innocent child just rehearsing a piano piece for a piano lesson. And even in the first shot, we see this horse galloping by in the distance. White horse? Yeah. I had to stop and... I was like, is that a unicorn? No, of course it, not. It, but you know, <laughs> with this kind of fuzzy 70s Bob Guccione filter on everything, it mm -hmm. does look like a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. It does look like there's a galloping unicorn mm -hmm. in the background. Everything is so idyllic and beautiful and, and wonderful and innocent and lovely. And what happens is we see Christine, uh, we only see this... Actually, no, we do see it directly. We see her falling under the water, chasing after her ball in that one shot of her just sinking down into the muck. And it's quite a quite a horrible scene. Um, any thoughts on that opening? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of thoughts. Um, it has like such a hazy quality. And this time I definitely watched the Criterion collection which i think has been remastered or something yeah in like 2015 i think i read it looks a lot clearer and um i think last year when i watched it i must have found it online or it was streaming somewhere but um everything all the colors were so muted this time i was like really taken aback by how colorful everything was and how much the red pops mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I also like how um, right from the beginning, the timeline of this is like all off. We're like flipping back and forth and we see the church that we're about to spend a lot of the movie in um, before they're ever in Italy. And just things are all out of place. Just on that note, uh, it's very fast, but that weird shot of those curtains, I think it's the very, very first shot of the movie. It's this odd 
perforated curtain that we see shuffling back and forth. We don't see that again until they're in Venice. Oh, really? So it's not even their own house. Oh, so interesting. The timeline is already mm-hmm. all screwy. And that's that's a, I love that about this movie where the timeline is you don't know what what tense you're in. Right. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um Christopher loves a movie with a pale little blonde girl on a dock. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a specific yeah. genre? Yeah. Maybe interesting. But I mean, I don't think Christine is a bad seed though. She, no. She's not. No. Yeah. She We're definitely watching not. Poltergeist. Christopher's next <laughs> pick <laughs> is Poltergeist. <laughs> oh, I would love that. I like that right away we see Christine's red jacket and then we also see the red cloaked figure in that picture of the church. So we're already making a connection there. Yeah, we are introduced to some unusual figure in a red cloak in every single one of the slides that Donald Sutherland is looking at. And yeah, it's it's such an odd scene because th- that f- and the figure is sometimes on different sides of the pew. Yeah. Oh, I didn't notice that. I noticed that and I I watching this totally blind not knowing anything about it. I was just like, oh, they just have pictures of her in this church for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't, but obviously, obviously that's not correct. Hey, honey, <laughs> just go sit right there. Yeah, you sit here and look weird. Don't <laughs> face Nailed us. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, turn around. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to see you. Don't I don't want to hear you. Yeah, right. This is going to be important for when we're, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, this this whole opening sequence is it, it immediately drew me in because there's so many things that they are really deliberately trying to get you to pay attention to, like the the glass being broken under the wheels and the little detail of him taking the pieces of glass out. And I couldn't tell if the you could tell that something bad was going to happen. It wasn't clear if both of the kids were in danger. And then mm-hmm. I, the other thing from this scene, I've seen stills of Donald Tyler holding the the daughter and, and screaming before. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that also immediately, you know, I immediately recognized that. And um, it's a, boy, killing a small child at the beginning of a movie is a bold choice in a movie. In a major motion picture, especially in 1973, that was really I love Donald Sutherland in that whole scene because he drove that whole scene. He was in the in his house with his wife, and he could felt he felt something wrong, and he dashed out of the house. And again, with that parallel editing, and he's dashing out, and then he's trying to get her out of the pond and performing. I wrote he does CPR all wrong. I know, but he's oh, trying to grab her so chin, poorly. Dude, but you the intensity of like that that grief that he's feeling of like not being able to help and just finding her. And then like the brother Johnny just standing there with like a piece of glass in his hand with like a bloody finger. And like the mom's still not there yet, but he's just like in this terrible anguish. And you know that that sets his mind frame up or his mindset up for the rest of the film is that intense grief. Right. Yeah, so we see water here plays a huge role Mm -hmm. in the rest of the movie. We see shattering glass, (laughs) of course the color red. And I think those three main things just keep coming up mm-hmm. again and again in so many scenes. There's like weird like splicing of little scenes too. Like Laura makes this weird kind of hand motion in front of her mouth and then we see Christine do the same thing. Right. Like there's so many weird little parallels. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very fun to watch. Not, not fun, but it's very <laughs> enjoyable to pick up on that and just see how intentional. And the editing, holy smokes, just blew me away. I loved all that. But you mentioned the scene at the beginning and the editing, and that that's going to parallel like the a, the a big ending scene with that editing as well, right? Just like a two bookends on the film, right? No, great to me, great opening set things up. You still have questions, you want to figure stuff out, you don't know what's going on with the slide, where are they, and then you get there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Even Christine's original question that Laura's trying to solve is. Um, if the world is round, why is a frozen pond flat? Like even the question is about the pond and about right. water. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I also love the way that Donald Sutherland, Sutherland runs out. He looks like a baby horse, just like kind of. 
I know. <laughs> the way he like almost trips and he just like keeps propelling his body forward. Yeah, yeah he's not like an action star. It's like a it's like a befuddled dad running out. It's yeah. it's yeah. And like in a panic. Like yeah. no yeah. It, it's really good. I also love the way that like um the red bleeds across the projector slide. Mm-hmm. Just really interesting to watch. And we see that a couple times. Mm-hmm. So the book does not open this way. Mm-hmm. The book opens with the couple already in Venice. Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad that the movie has this other tie in with water because it all makes sense and they do it so well. It's almost like the author missed a chance to have this have this motif running through the whole story. Oh, definitely. Because she dies of meningitis mm-hmm. in the right. book. It's mm-hmm. so weird. Yeah. One, I don't even know what that is, but yeah. <laughs> and I like how they not good. <laughs> and I like how giving the them that on that they are re, redoing the church. I like that architectural aspect that just adds more to. I thought it did a nice job um, with a bit of a comparison to like some of the spaces that they were in, like the weird little hotels and running through the canals and the tunnels, and it sets up some really cool scenes with the church and right. Plus, with the 70s, mm-hmm. you got to have the church in there one yeah. way or the other because right? it's <laughs> extra scary. Right. Yeah. yeah, I was glad to see nobody was, in theory, possessed in this film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Came out the same year. And I do right? like a possession film. Yeah. Came out the same year as The Exorcist, didn't it? Really? I think so. Yeah. 73. Wow. Yeah. What an awesome year for horror. Yeah. One little detail I loved is when he pulls his daughter out of the um water he's like holding her little hand in one of his hands saw that yeah it's rough yeah and the little girl filmed all of that i had like a little pond and a little what do you call it like a a little pool like a tank or something yeah a tank that they put a bunch of seaweed and stuff in and that scene when she's just like floating i'm like it's heartbreaking Mm -hmm. and it's it's beautiful it's like they filmed that in December. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Yikes. Brisk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hours in the pond. Mm. Oh. Well, after that, we see the couple in Venice, and we see Donald Sutherland consulting on a church restoration. Um, then Donald Sutherland and Julia Christie are in a cafe, and they're talking about lunch. And here's where we get the title of the movie that we don't know about from the movie. We only know about this from the book. Mm-hmm. So does anyone remember? I read it, but I don't remember. So in the book, Amanda. Oh. I didn't read the book. Okay. I know the scene you're talking about. Right. So in the book, the first line of the, the book is, mm-hmm. don't look now, but there are two... Um, odd twins right behind you or something like something that. Something like that, oh, yeah. yeah. Right. I did think it was interesting because this whole watch for me was a rewatch, so I was looking at all the details a little more closely, and Donald Sutherland clocks those two sisters right away, like right. immediately. Yeah, exactly. Weird. The two weird sisters. Mm-hmm. And so eventually uh, Laura goes into the bathroom with the two unusual old ladies and they're talking and talking and one of the sisters is completely blind but she has second sight and she very clearly tells Laura details about their dead daughter and how Laura should be happy because Christine is right there with her and it's there are so many specific details. She's that it, smiling. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> She's with me. Okay, weirdo, shut up. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, even if that were true, I would never, ever, ever tell someone that. Like, right. yeah. just rude, inappropriate. Even, yeah. even rude. On this rewatch, <laughs> um, even on this rewatch, I found myself rewinding the bathroom scene because at first I didn't realize that the other sister was the other woman in the bathroom. I thought it was just Christine or the mom, Laura, with, um, is the blind woman named Heather? Yeah. Heather? Like Heather, Heather, and Heather and Wendy. Wendy. Heather and Wendy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Heather. And so when she's speaking with Heather, I, w- I wrote a note like, who is the other woman in the bathroom? Then I watched it again. I'm like, no, it's the other sister. It's Wendy. Right. 
Um, but even when they were walking to also this whole thing about there's something in my eye, it's so dramatic. And mm-hmm. and then Laura's like, well, let me help you. Why are you going to let a stranger? My blind sister's going to help me get this thing out of my eye. <laughs> also, you're going to let a stranger like put their fingers like in right. your eye. But I love how we see that the close up of that that giant brooch that one of them is wearing. The like mermaid. Yeah, type. yeah, yeah. And that comes up a couple times later, just for like a background. Right. Um, but that was a weird. The bathroom scene was was intense and weird, and he. I didn't quite know where it was going to go. The sisters in general, anytime I, anytime they're on screen, it feels uneasy and yeah. weird and like I'm being lied to. Well, because mm-hmm. you're wondering, like I was wondering, I'm like, oh, well, are they the bad guys? Is something bad going to happen? You yeah. Know, what kind of slight does she have? Well, they are so unusual. And later on in the movie, we do see them laughing maniacally. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And we never. Like multiple times. Sinister. Yeah. Multiple times. It's very strange. We never. Exactly. See what they're laughing at unless they're laughing at how they're just manipulating things. But it's, again, nothing is as it seems. Also, mm-hmm. why are they there? They are in. They end up staying in like two different hotel rooms. What? Why, what is their purpose? Why are they there? Right. They're in this hotel. Actually, yeah, because they're having dinner. So they're like, where are they from? Why are they yeah. in Venice? It kind of reminds me of um, like Rosemary's Baby where Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. um, neighbors are always sort of there and they're helpful and, oh, we need you to help us with this. Or Erin, I mean, just sort of um, manipulating and getting her closer to their circle. But this is the beginning, too, where those two sisters are completely entangled in like everything that happens to Laura after that point. Right. Because she this is a device to help manage or think to focus her grief is still you know, connect with Christine. Yeah. You're so sad and you don't have to be. I'm going to be because my kid is dead. My kid died. Yeah. Like, yeah. even if she's right here laughing, I don't really care. Yeah. Yeah. I prefer her live. <laughs> yeah, right. I also, and I didn't, when watching the movie the first time, I didn't know who that the boy was. I'm like, oh, is that a neighbor? Why is he just biking by? And then later, like, you can see the boy with the dad, so you realize that's the other kid. But the whole the rest of the time they're in Italy, I'm like, where's their kid? Where's the other son? They're so upset because their daughter died. They leave the son. Where's the son? And later on, we find out that he's, like, in, you know, a boarding school or whatever back at home. But I'm like, where is the... We They don't really talk about Johnny. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, they mention him a couple times. But like, Which is weird. We don't really hear. I'm like, where's Johnny? Yeah. Here's... Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure that's going to be really good for his psyche too. His sister yeah. dies, and his parents are like, "See yeah. ya." We're gonna we're gonna go to Italy for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I also had moments where this reminded me of The Omen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some of the the horror scenes that happen later remind me of The Omen, and the little boy when we see the little boy in the boarding school. I don't know. See, the movie that comes to my mind is The Sentinel so much. It it had to be another 70s movie. Mm -hmm. It has that same creepy, weird neighbor feel. And uh, Ruth Gordon is in it. It's so good. It's one of my favorites from childhood. Is this the one with the brown stone? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Do you have a year on that, Matt? 77. Okay. Oh, later. Wow. There were two little details here that stuck out to me. Um, one, before the bathroom scene, um, John and Laura are ordering their meals and Laura says, I'll have what I had last night. Yeah. One, how is this man supposed to remember what you <laughs> ordered? Like every night that you're there. Cause he's that good. But two, <laughs> it's like another like timey wimey, like, oh, I'll repeat the same thing I did yesterday. Right. Like things happening over and over. Right. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, I also love, there's just some random lady in the bathroom watching all this shit go down. Even. They keep cutting to her like in a stall and then she's like. <laughs> well, she's the, the de or the, uh, the like stall lady. What? Oh, like a. Like <clears throat> you either oh. have to pay her for toilet paper or you have to like, or she's there to make sure everything's okay or <laughs> right like a know. bathroom Thumbs attendant up. we're doing great <laughs> in here <laughs> yeah there are some bathrooms that still have like an attendant who are there to like resupply the paper towels and the the, the, the feminine products and the hand soap and like, there's candies in, in there yeah. yeah i don't remember what restaurant it was but there was the some Masonic guy Temple. that gave me a mint um, Masonic Temple has them sometimes in the bathroom. Are you supposed to like tip them? Oh yeah, that's right. Because we had, we mm-hmm. waved them off for our wedding. We were just like, right. I don't need somebody in the bathroom for those people. Right. And it's I'm also, not eating yeah. any food that I receive in the yeah, bathroom exactly. either. <laughs> yeah. It's like the scene in Cable Guy, where uh, the the bathroom <laughs> attendant gets waved away. Do you remember this scene? I'm trying to remember <laughs> that. Salt no. peanuts. Okay, well, that's, that's yeah. for another episode, podcast listener. I, I love that movie. 
<laughs> well, uh, Christine, sorry, not Christine. Laura comes back from the bathroom and she is overcome and she falls on the side of the table and everything is crashing down. And it's, I think it's another great editing scene where we see everything just spilling and breaking and crashing. So I, I gotta ask, I have to ask a potentially ignorant question. Has anybody ever been out with somebody and just had them faint like that? Uh, I've not been out nor have I witnessed. Have you ever been overwhelmed by something so much that you just faint? I feel like this happens a lot in movies from the early (laughs) seventies. Especially into women. It's like the vapors. Yeah, exactly. Oh dear. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I've never been in the situation, but I do feel like if some random blind lady was like, your kid is fine and your kid is right here next to you and happy. Right. And I'm going to tell you all about it. I, I might feel a little. Sure. Little. Strange. Like you take the table down with <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah. I, I also, feel like Donald Sutherland pushes it onto her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and then they end up calling like the, the ambulance boat and she gets, she goes to the hospital. What was even, what were they checking her for? Like. Well, she was there for like three seconds. She right. faints in the bathroom too, because they cut to Heather and Wendy being like, "You good?" And she's like, "Yeah, I'm fine." And then she goes out and faints again. Mm. I would be concerned. Well, there was no. Was there like a diagnosis or a result? She gets to the hospital and she goes, "John, look at the all vapors. these kids. There's kids here." <laughs> yeah, just get her some smell. It was the closest they took her fine. to the children's hospital because it was the closest one, I guess. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. so weird. Also, I'd love that little. I love the boats as the mode of transportation in this so much. Every time a new boat was there, I'm like, oh, look at this boat. Look at the sides of it. Look now they're getting yeah. in and out of the boat. Slows and, everything down, yeah. but. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like want a variety of boats. Like, I want the ATM boat to come by. <laughs> <you know>? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought I was, look, I was the, after traveling with some, putting some seniors onto a boat uh, just the other day, it made me think about the accessibility <laughs> of the boats. Like, at the end, when, like, the two sisters, one of them is blind as they're trying to, like, get off this boat, I'm like, how are they? And obviously people did this for a right. long time in many different places around the world, but I'm still just like, I'm like, huh? That's they did a really good job getting off that boat. Yeah, <laughs> you it's, know, it's no small feat putting a senior on a boat. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's just true. No, because somebody, if you have it, like accessibility, yeah. like that's mm-hmm. there has to be some sort of a thing they can do. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I, according I to my parents. Cool. <laughs> One, this is one of the things that was fucking me up because like an hour after I watched this movie and wrote, wow, an, a water ambulance, that's kind of cool. My parents sent a picture of a water ambulance going by. But I guess they said that um, like a lot of the streets in Venice are so small that like it's impossible to get through the city, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. through the streets. So that's why they use a lot of the canals and rivers and stuff to yeah. get around. Even there's police boats later. Mm-hmm. I know that from James Bond. Yeah, Which we're going to talk about. We Later. are. Right. We are. Oh yeah. Spoiler alert. That's Great. Right. I know a lot about James Bond. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> After, oh, I wanted to make one point here. Some people interpret the color red as a signifier of danger or death in mm-hmm. every scene. However, one of the little boys is bounce is playing with a Same red ball. ball yeah. that's striped. At the hospital. Right. Right. And I so I thought, well, it's not as simple as just red equals danger or death mm-hmm. because it's just showing up in a lot of places in this movie and it pops right out of the screen mm-hmm. that yeah. color. Mm-hmm. I there, guess it oh go ahead. No, no. no. There was a scene later. Um, when there's a police boat and all the kids are wearing caps, all the kids have some something that's red. But I also really, really, really love the scene later where um, the red and white ball pops up. It's in Laura's suitcase. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Like John like sees it in there. And for me, that was a cool tale, a tell because she's still grieving and hanging on to that. That's part of the ball. So maybe you, the in red is not just on kids or attached to kids. But mm-hmm. yeah, you're right. It's not all menacing and deaf. Yeah, right. And the ball is an interesting detail because it just perfectly fits the two parents' MOs where John, like, doesn't want to deal and he's just, like, avoiding it and, like, sinking himself into work. And um, Laura is, like, unable to let go, just, like, totally attached, like, hoping that Mm -hmm. she's, like, able to find her daughter again through these, like, weird fucking ladies. But, of course, she has the ball because she can't let go of anything. Yeah. Um, I don't want to say too much about it, but this... Reminded me so much of Lake Mungo. 
Mm, which I've like, seen thanks to Allison. Mm, Amanda didn't like it. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> I made her watch it and she was like, nope. <laughs> but I love that movie and there's a lot of similarities there. Lake Mungo. It's great. It's Australian. Um, the filmmaker, it's one of my favorite movies. The filmmaker made that and then never made anything else. And It, it broke them. Yeah. Um, huh. I think it's streaming on Prime right now. Is, is it from the 80s? Ads. No, it's from the 2000s. Yeah, 2008. it's more recent. Um, great movie. Love it's, it. Okay. You have to go into it with like sort of a similar vibe here where it's not really like horror. It's about like everyday mm. sort of horror. But sure. Yeah, highly recommend. And there's a lot of um, interesting parallels here. I'm sure he watched this movie. Um. I also wanted to just mention that when Laura is uh, loaded onto the water ambulance, John takes her hand. The same, like he held her hand here, and then she, he also held Christine's hand when he pulled her out of the water. So another little connection. Nice there. little detail. Well, in the next scene, we see John and Laura stopping at a church to light candles, mm -hmm. and somewhere in the bonus features we learned that four pages of dialogue were thrown out here. Mm -hmm. What a great editing choice. Yeah. Seriously. Although I will have to say I was a little confused at exactly what happened in this scene. Does John fall asleep? Mm -hmm. He's He's got his his head in his hands for uh, it seemed like a long time. And then we see that woman just kind of dancing through the church. Do you remember that shot? What? I missed all of that. I don't remember that. I vaguely remember this. This is the scene where Laura asks John for some money to to light a candle. <clears throat> and she wants and to he light says, six of them. And right. And then he says, I just don't like this church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the next scene, we see John like peering from behind a pillar. And then he puts his head down in his hands. It's almost like he falls asleep. And he's watching oh. a tour group go by, almost like he's spying on them. And in that odd woman comes by and at first I thought it was one of the weird sisters mm -hmm. but she's just like floating by behind the bars do you remember I this? I don't remember this and I did not fall oh, asleep oh I see <laughs> <laughs> well in my notes it is Wendy that walks in as part of the tour and then John like hides and it's like his face okay and so yeah in the church is that what you're talking about? that's right about? it must be that that really was her <laughs> I guess that would make sense <laughs> My only other note for this says, the lady acts weird, and then in quotes, ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I know what that means. <laughs> My note is they go to church. I love stream of consciousness notes because they're full of shit like that. Like, whoa. <laughs> but too, I like, too, that they were in the church, and that's John. They're there for John to do the restoration work, and it also goes back to some of the slides he was working on and how, yeah. you know, things looked is this where he plays I, with that weird light, too? Weird light. No. No, that's later. That's I okay. think so. It's that switch thing? Yeah. No, no, I'm wrong. Oh. He does play with that. Okay, that's what, uh -huh. yeah. at yeah. first I thought, that's a fucking live wire or <laughs> something. <laughs> then he reached his hand up and just started <laughs> messing with it. But I could relate to that, because if I was dragged into a church like that, Without a plan of going there, I would hey, be. What doing does this really do? Good. We all turn into twelve-year-old boys. What's this boys. thing? Yeah, <laughs> what's this? I don't like this church. Push this button. Uh, right before they go to the church, uh, Laura says, "John, Christine is still with us," and his face just like melts. It just drops immediately. Sad. It, yeah. Well, and it feels like he's probably heard this a bunch, like because she's still understandably still thinking about it and bringing it up a lot and he's just trying to move on well john meets with his priest friend who is weird I, yeah i i don't remember <laughs> he's his, a little weird his name right now nickel is it i just no. wrote the bishop in all my yeah bishop notes. uh we do learn his name barbary <laughs> yeah. but anyway he is an odd character, and he's got this great line where he says, the churches belong to God, but he doesn't seem to care about them. Mm. Right. So he seems a little off his game, off his church game. <laughs> a little jaded. Right. <laughs> um, and I 
think this happens later, even though I've got it in my notes, is happening right around now. We learn that there is a murderer running around mm-hmm. Venice, mm-hmm. and there's a victim hauled out of the canal. Ooh, yeah. Right. And it's such a striking, brutal scene. So we see this uh, young girl or this woman who's hauled up from her feet. And I, th- I think because it's right after the meeting with the priest, it's this, it's almost this dark satanic inversion of a crucifixion Mm -hmm. and it's also coming out of the water which is you know the water is supposed to be a purifier so it's it's really a a dark dark scene (laughs) i'm so dumb i was like oh she would be so embarrassed if everyone was seeing her underwear like if she knew her (laughs) underwear was out right now (laughs) it also and this is jump this scene jumps ahead from other things that are happening yet but it made me question i'm like oh is that laura you know, mm-hmm. with the long blonde I hair. I thought the same thing. Because she looked she had, the same from the she back. Had the, her, I, yeah, actually, I thought she the She looked exact, like the yeah. same like size and shape and with her the, the blonde hair hanging down. Because mm-hmm. at that point, he's still trying. He thinks his wife is at home. Mm-hmm. Right. Right? At that, is that? We skipped uh, several scenes. I So I do think I have this out of order. This with is, the body, yeah, yeah. I think oh. the body comes later on. Oh, because okay. they have to go visit. They have to go visit the sisters. Yeah. Um, and then they hear about their kid having an accident. And when she's gone is when John is with. I just remember that John is with the bishop at this point, And I thought, yeah. Because oh, yeah. then he, there's the accident that he's in. We can shift this around. Yeah. Right. Yeah. One thing the bishop does that I love is he asks Laura, are you Christian? And she says, well, I'm kind to animals and children. So, like, n- no. That's like, a no. That- That's a soft no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What an awesome exchange that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's his, and she like kisses his ring kind of instinctively or something. And he calls her out on it after the fact too. Right. Like, why'd, you, why'd you kiss his ring? Yeah. <laughs> but it's kind of playful too. It's yeah. kind yeah. of funny. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff I love about this movie. It like really feels realistic and like they're like an actual couple. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Not just like it seems really genuine. Movie mm-hmm. couple. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which brings us to the scene in the hotel. So, Wait, which scene? <laughs> <laughs> which four-minute infamous yeah. scene are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so this is quite a tangle we've got going on here. <laughs> but it's, it is really interesting. I read a lot about this and watched a lot of the bonus features where they talk about this. And I think one... One of the awesome parts is in this is the editing. Again, yeah. we come back to this really awesome editing, almost like, so the scene is cut between them naked having sex and them getting dressed afterwards. Mm -hmm. And it is almost like the sex is now a memory and they're just getting ready to go Mm -hmm. out for dinner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I liked about this scene, I liked the importance. It gave you this, um, this connection that they still have each other with the, which each other and how yes. comfortable they are together. They were just two adults being natural, even though they had all this stuff going on. And it made it seem like that this was something that hadn't happened in a while. I so I'd like that. Also kind of makes you wonder like maybe they want to have another kid. Yeah. You know? Totally. But it was just maybe really be- it was really beautifully done. And I just liked getting this glimpse into like their relationship outside of like the grief or going out to dinner or going from point A to point B. I liked seeing a little bit of that, that intimacy. Mm-hmm. I love John at the sink brushing his teeth. Like, yep. come on, everyone does that. You know what I mean? Not mm-hmm. na- naked necessarily, but just like, yeah. you know, just yeah. a really cool bathroom too. Yeah. It's huge. Very it's cool. Like, bathroom. Where the, the giant are they staying? <clears throat> plant. Well, and then I love Julie Christie saying, you're getting those funny lumps on your <laughs> sides again. Really? Yeah. Yeah, and he's like thin as a rail. Thin as a rail. <laughs> yeah, right. And I'm like, he does? I was watching that going, oh, God. <laughs> He goes over to weigh himself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the 70s. Like immediately. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, too, because if you ask me, he looks like a frog. Like his light, like so thin. He's so thin. He yeah, he's super thin. He's a little string bean. In <laughs> yeah. The 70s. Yeah. I like sort of this scene because it is like intimate in a kind of true to life way but uh didn't enjoy the sex scene because to me this man is president snow from the hunger games and no one wants to watch a grandpa (laughs) doing it 
That's I don't remember that well. Yeah. <laughs> I only know him like current day. <laughs> so. So just I associate him with JFK. Like I don't mm-hmm. know, and just what? there's some uh, in the movie JFK. Oh, is he JFK? No, he's oh. he's a guy that Kevin Costner talks to on the he's bench. He's like a deep throat kind yeah, of character. It's like, yeah, but I don't know. He also did a weird thing with his tongue in one of the scenes. And also it just, it it's funny. I, this was another scene I was aware of because it was, um, it, it's, it was thought to be unsimulated uh, yeah. for a long time. And, and I guess, I think it was an inside the actor's studio maybe that Donald, Donald Sutherland was like, no, it was absolutely scripted. There were people yelling at me like, lick her nipple. Yeah. <laughs> Get on top, like you know <laughs> that kind of shit. And so, yeah, it's 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 wild. It's wild to think that, especially in the early '70s, mm-hmm. when you couldn't get away with very much, that this ended up in this movie, mm-hmm. yeah. like but this. It wasn't without. Uh, oh sure. A kerfuffle and like yeah. Julie Christie's husband Warren Beatty had some issues. I didn't realize that. What did he say? I want you to like cut it out of the movie. <laughs> yeah, I want you to take this out pubic hair by pubic hair. Ew. Something oh my gosh. so I don't know. Yeah, it was something very I think and I mean it is a really long scene. You didn't need to see that much skin or that you did not, but for this I liked showing the couple in this way and I think the style of it with the way it was parallel out of day with them getting dressed and how it was kind of backwards. It kind of just goes with the loopy way the film went. Because if I was just watching a movie and there was a really long, like, graphic four-minute sex scene, sometimes it would be jarring or it wouldn't quite fit. Like, oh, let's just put some naked bodies in there, you know? But for this, it just stylistically, it kind of matched it for me. It didn't detract from it. I, it fit the movie for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is kind of amazing that, that it happened and that it yeah. existed and yep. stayed in and got, like, what, rated X or whatever. Yeah, in the middle of this, like, pretty like gloomy and tense movie and then it's this like ah mm-hmm. music is playing the whole time which is weird <laughs> it's like super 70s students. yeah it's yes. yeah very 70s and then afterwards but. like they leave to go out to dinner and that's when we see find out that there's not in the murder where they find the boat but we there you hear that noise where somebody's screaming and this is when like the first person was being killed uh, right maybe oh. yeah i remember that scream but not thinking much of it Hmm. Huh. They're like running through the tunnels and they get lost. All right. Maybe I'm wrong. No, I there, are, there was a gasp and a scream and then we see the red coated person running. For the first time. Oh, for the first right. time. Yeah. All yeah. that I know from reading about this movie is that you can interpret all kinds of shit from this. So I don't think that anybody is wrong. So that really. was my first inkling of thinking that that was the murderer. Yeah. I think that makes sense. That does happened. make sense. Because then later then later on when they there was they find that they drag the woman whose body we just talked about, they drag the woman out of the water on the police boat when his wife's in with his son, that was the second murder. That's how we sort of know there's a murderer on the loose running mm-hmm. around Italy. Well, there's also when Donald Sutherland is on a boat and the boat driver's getting really mad and someone yells at him, it's homicide. Do you remember that scene? Is that what he said? Oh, yeah. I was huh. just confused but that whole In time. In English? In... Christopher just knows Italian. Yeah, I, he knows how to say homicide. <laughs> I Italian. wouldn't be surprised. I, I know the scene you're talking about. And I had no idea what the fuck was happening in it. Yeah. I thought that it was just like, it honestly, it made me feel like I was in the boat with them looking around being like, I don't know why these people are mad at each other. I don't <laughs> yeah. know what that guy just yelled. <laughs> well, doesn't she also say like, isn't this the place? Like something like that. And it's like, does she think that she's been here before? Yeah. Like, what? It, it like really adds to the kind well, of. Because that's when she decides, like, I want to stop at that church. Yeah. Right. Isn't that in that same boat oh, ride? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not it his is. church. It's some random church. That right. They were, oh, by. it's closed, which, yeah. How the fuck can you tell? But um, <laughs> um, God said. Yeah, right. But but then that other one's open. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I want to say about the sex scene is Donald Sutherland talks a lot about that in one of the bonus features. And he talks about an unblimped Aeroflex, which was a kind of a camera that was so loud oh Mm -hmm. yes and he Mm -hmm. he does the noise of the camera going off and he said you know if there was any question having that going off in the room so loud was enough to kill everyone's (laughs) mood (laughs) yeah i think i also read it was the first scene that they filmed yes 
damn, they are good actors. And yep. they try to do it like, like they just rented a hotel room and the two actors and like three like film people went in and they filmed it. They tried to do it discreetly, which is. I think neat. that's how most mm-hmm. pornos are filmed yeah. too. I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know With what? The, the sound of the flex. camera that's probably right. gave it away. Yeah. <laughs> and nobody's happy about it. <laughs> Well, we see the couple getting lost on their way to dinner. Mm-hmm. And we also, this might be one of the times where we see the sign on the wall saying Venice in peril. Yeah, which comes what's up, up with that? Yeah. I, I think what it's referring to the fact of Venice sinking or being washed away or just the sea, you know, huh. claiming a lot of the territory is what I think. Interesting. Um and at some point in here, we do see the figure in red uh, running around. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it probably is when they're on their way out. To and dinner. I think so. They're and and they're dinner. lost. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, then someone's, they hear a gasp and a scream. We see the red, a red coat running. And I think Chris, or um, I keep calling Laura, Christine. Laura says that it was a, a cat, or one of them says it was a cat or a rat. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I love how she runs away. They see that little white rat and she's like, yeah. <laughs> Turns around, books it out of there. Yeah, gets right. lost immediately. <laughs> this pet store rat. <laughs> <laughs> well, later on, Laura meets back up with the sisters and learns that John has second sight. Mm-hmm. Um, she comes back in an attempt to contact Christine and I. They're having a little bit of a seance. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mumbo jumbo about ectoplasm and holding hands. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Because John what, doesn't want her to go. Right, and John is at the bar drinking. Cause, nearby, because he was worried about her. Right. Because they see them in the church, and Lord takes off with them. There's another line here that didn't make any sense to me, and I may I tried to watch it a few times. One of the weird sisters says, "Are your legs closed?" Yes. Oh, or I, crossed? It's yeah. like it's almost to. Sh- I I took that as it's almost to show you, like I can I I have second sight. I can tell what's happening right next to me. Oh, right. Okay. It was like a flex. I have a fun or, fact about that. I think they. No, you're right. Okay. Um, because they made the actress who plays Laura attend a seance before they filmed for Ooh. experience or something. I don't know. But um, that happened at the actual se- seance. So they added it into the film because they seem really loose. With, they're like, I don't know, going to church. What do you guys say to each other? That's in the film now. <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of those moments where, like, it, it's kind of based on something that happened in real life during pre production. Ah, oh, that's cool. Okay. That is cool. Wow. But it looked like she uncrossed her legs mm-hmm. and it's almost like she did that reflexively to be like no you know or something it's like getting your you hair know. cut you gotta be even <laughs> okay. my legs are crossed right now same <laughs> can you guys tell on that side of the room we can, can the podcast listener hear that the ones with sight can the ones with second through seventh yeah. sight john and, john and heather <laughs> So here we get the perhaps the funniest <laughs> line of the whole movie when John and Laura get back to the apartment and John says, I wouldn't go in there for a couple of minutes if I were you. Which is so weird because it's not like he took a big shit. Like, didn't he just he barf? He barf, didn't he? Yeah, it's just like, did you miss? <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to leave it. It's fine. And I didn't hear a fan or anything. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so on this podcast show we've talked many times about not listening to women and this comes up very clearly here so john does not believe his wife laura that the two weird sisters have something real going on but i'm it's interesting that these movies are so often written and directed by men so I think that's kind of an interesting aspect to this whole debate. It's almost like men know better, and yet they're still failing to listen to people. Mm-hmm. 
Well, there's a lot of like kind of weird elements of that in this movie where like, um, you know, the headmaster calls later and he can't get any words out and his wife takes the phone. She's like, come on. And then she ma- like she communicates. And I feel like there's so many instances of like women communicating with each other and like that going well. And then the men are just like totally incapable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like he doesn't even realize that he has second sight, mm-hmm. but they all know and they can tell. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like a, I'd be curious when the f- first um, example of this trope in a movie is where it's like the guy doesn't believe in the woo woo bullshit. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the, and the girl does, yeah. um, it ends up being right. Or, yeah. Yeah. It made me think too about the orphanage mm-hmm. with the two parents in that one. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, thanks, Allison. We found our through line. Um, but that's the same thing where the dad doesn't believe in the mom intensely, again, because they're grieving parents, but they're doing it differently. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I thought about them, and this was my first time, I've only seen this movie twice, but it was the my first time watching after having seen the orphanage. And so you're watching, they're in a different country. They are both grieving the death of their child. There's water and the father does not believe. And the mother is trying to communicate and do the things. Mm -hmm. And it's not the only movies that it's been done in. (laughs) She's attending the seance. She's, but here you also have the two women, the two sisters who are more women. And here John's just like, you know, in Italy, he's doing work, you know, he's redoing this church. He's like working distracted. They're in that mode. And she's just trying to find like meaning and purpose. And it's interesting because the women are the ones who have that power and the men are just kind of like, you know, bumbling around them a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The other thing I think about though, is like, if I were in John's shoes, I would also be skeptical because I feel like so often mm-hmm. in real life, like vulnerable people are the ones who are preyed on by manipulative people. Mm-hmm. And so like, oh, yeah. If I start seeing these two women everywhere and they're creating these, you know, opportunities to draw your wife into this weird shit that you don't believe in, like, I, I think I would be hesitant to kind of go along with it, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, Absolutely. Too, and that's when uh, she does go with them and he's like, I'm not falling in for the mumbo jumbo. And she goes, that's just what they called it, too, John. That's not what it is. Um, that's a great and then impression. <laughs> they're like running up the stairs together. Um, but then he stays nearby like he she goes and does that in the room with them to do the seance and he's like drinking nearby and then when she comes out he like he's right there Mm -hmm. because yeah i would be totally protective because she is extremely vulnerable and you saw that at the beginning when she was Mm -hmm. um in the the hotel or the um hotel restaurant she fainted twice there yeah that kind of set up to her like i don't want to use the word instability but her just her vulnerability of like the grief and trying to manage and she had that little glimpse and, and she's in it she's yeah. like she's 100 mm-hmm. percent in it even yeah. when she's, she's grasping mm-hmm. walking with the sisters they're in step they're taking mm-hmm. left foot right foot all in the like all three of them in a row mm-hmm. which i think is interesting because i think people naturally mirror each other when they're in tune with each other yeah and then when the two sisters show up at the church where john is trying to very unsafely put that giant statue on the side of it <laughs> And he sees the two sisters there and he's immediately concerned because he sees his wife disappear with them. And he says, oh, no, oh, no, they're going to, you know, he doesn't want them feeding her mind with more of their mumbo jumbo or whatever. Back to that scene, Amanda, the very last shot of that scene is with Laura turning the corner with the two sisters. And if you look in the very background, unfocused, you still see John staring at her Oh, really? Yeah, it's really a cool detail. You can see him leaning way back out and staring. And it's, yeah, the movie is, I think, in so many ways, meticulously made. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even, like, one of the very first shots of the movie, it's like a close-up of a fire in a fireplace, and then it zooms out and you see Laura, and then it zooms out more and you see John. Like, there's so many really interesting, like, pieces of camera work in this. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I also think it's so sad that Laura asked him to just go with it to get rid of her like emptiness and pain. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Heather says something really interesting here where she says that John has the gift, even if he doesn't know or if he's rejecting it. And um, she says it's a gift and a curse, which is something I've been thinking about a lot, like duality and 
there's a movie I might choose for an upcoming episode of our podcast that like deals a lot with that. So I was like, oh my god, hmm. all, all the pieces are aligning here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in, I think it's the next scene, we see this amazing accident in the church that John is nope. restoring. Mm -hmm. Nope. Dumb son of a bitch. Don't go up that weird ladder. Did oh, no. You... I'm saying nope. Like, that oh. is a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. That was the hardest part of the movie for me. I right. loved it. That was as like... A heart, as a heights person? Oof. Yeah. <laughs> I loved it. Oh, yeah. It's It's... I'd say that like to be silly. It's awesome. It's yeah. such a good it's such a good scene. You can immediately tell that it's gonna go very poorly. Not so in the insane. way that you expect. And so Donald Sutherland did his own stunts in this yeah. scene. The stuntman refused to do it. I know. Well, uh, for good reason. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he my. wasn't rigged up there, right? My well, God. and then Donald Sutherland like found out later that the wire that was supposed to be keeping him safe would have failed, failed. If anything yeah. would have happened. Man, so it's so awesome because we see Donald Sutherland climbing up this very uh, unsafe scaffolding, and then he kind of hops out onto this very teetery, precarious, precarious gondola that's way up 50 feet off the marble floor. And he's comparing the mosaic tiles to see what a good job the, the uh, counterfeiters have done in this church restoration. But then we see this silently, we see a board just fall from the ceiling and it must be three some seconds later before we see it crashing through the glass. Mm -hmm. Man, and it, again, this is almost like precognition mm -hmm. of foreshadowing, you know, a vision of what's coming into the future. And um, it gives you those three seconds to establish dread Yes, and then it immediately like it. It actually makes the crash into a jump scare somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that that was so successful. I I also <laughs> it was impossible for me to not notice the pieces of tape on the glass. That I'm curious what those what their practical use would be, other than wood goes through here. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just me. Um, also. The idea of trying to do, this just made me laugh, and I did rewind this a little bit, trying to do meticulous work on a platform that is, it's like, moving. comically moving side to side. Um, and he is just doing it. He, he doesn't, he do, you don't see for a second when he's on that, him going like, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. is what I would be doing. I'd be on my hands and knees yeah. like, I don't think I want to be up here anymore. I'm not, I'm not doing this. Yeah. Somebody get me down. Well, I want to know, I was curious as to what his exact role was. If he was the one who was like foreseeing or overseeing everything, why yeah. was he the one? Like he was literally hanging off a building earlier with that giant, heavy, heavy uh, statue and I'm like, this is very unsafe. And then later on when he's doing this, I'm like, it, was, it echoed that first scene. And I'm like, okay, here he is. He's still going to go up and check. I know he's excited that he wants to match the the tiles, but yeah. it looks so terrible and so unsafe. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like, yeah, dude, just please yeah, help yourself. We'll lift you up. Here we go. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but how many times can you shoot that scene? Once? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Jeez, if you got to get a lot of coverage, especially with all the angles they had for that man, too. And you see all of the mosaic tiles just spilling everywhere in midair. I mean, it is kind of a recreation of the cafe scene mm -hmm. where oh, things absolutely. are just mm -hmm. spilling and a huge mess and just this collapse and the glass. Lots of broken glass. And I loved with this. And there's this was one of my the three best parallel editing longer scenes. It was so much and so intense. Like even now, just talking about it, when you guys were just talking about it, my heart even started beating a little bit faster thinking about that pause and how intense it was. And I like the the camera angle where stuff was falling onto the camera lens as well. It's such a, it's so intense and cool. And he was just freaking dangling on that rope for. He's just going in circles. Felt like he was going for he's twenty flipping minutes. Flipping and flopping. And I'm like, dude, stop moving. Would you just yeah. stop? I know he was trying to swing himself to like land to the other side to hang yeah. on. But he was just like twisting in circles, like little pirouettes. I'm like, stop. Yeah. Um, but it was really cool too to find out that like he was just doing all of those things like unsafely himself. Right, man. Yeah. Also, I'm really sad about. I mean, all that work's gonna be lost now. All those little mosaic tiles and. I know. Yeah. And what, they have to this, build another shitty little rickety thing to get yeah. back up there. <laughs> 
Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> old. It's very old timey. Old timey. OSHA. OSHA wouldn't stand for that shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Italian OSHA yeah. doesn't care. But also, there's, like, there's no there rules construction set. site. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting because it's a lot of the same, like, elements that we saw before. Like, the broken glass is a precursor to something happening. And then so many instances of people falling. Like, he's obviously dangling. Um, his wife fell earlier. His son's about to fall at school. Oh, he, he's all already, already fell. Yeah. Yeah. Laura's already gone. Um, and then his daughter obviously fell in the water. Um, and the bishop's brother died that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just weird, like, um, uh, like a cyclical thing. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like everything's always happening over and over and over in mm -hmm. different configurations. Well, we do find out that little Johnny has taken a fall and Laura is on the next flight back to England to just make sure that he's okay. So the, the concierge takes care of this and John sees Laura off on the, the little boat that goes to the airport. Airport boat. Airport boat. Gets <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>, the Uber. <laughs> And we assume that she has gone back to England. But in a future scene, John is on another boat and he looks out and there is Laura with the two weird sisters floating past him on a boat. So this leads to quite a manhunt. Uh, John meets with the police. He gets a police sketch and John frantically tries to go find their old apartment and without any success. Mm -hmm. The two weird sisters have left. But the police in the meantime have been able to track them down and they've arrested one of them. And at some point, John calls England to check on his son. And the woman who answers the phone says, oh, and here's Laura, you can talk to her. What? <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost hard to believe that Laura is there because we very, very clearly saw her in the boat with the mm -hmm. two sisters. Mm -hmm. But she really is in England. We hear her and she seems normal. And she says she's on her way back now to mm -hmm. Italy. Well, too, when we meet John at the boat before this, so John had just fallen off a scaffolding. He goes for a, a walk with whoever that guy is, and that's when they find them dragging that body out of the canal. So John is further traumatized by everything that's happening. Then he goes home and calls. He finds out that his wife was never, she that she was still there. He he goes back to the apartment. He puts all of his stuff in a bag. He's going to hop on a boat and go back to see his wife and son, and that's when he realizes that she's not gone. So then he gets off and is going to stay. So it's he's in this total like just tailspin of like what what is real and what is not, and we are following him along too, not quite you know, putting all the pieces together, all the glasses just like laying all over the place. Right. Yeah, do it's so intense. Do you remember when he fishes out of the water on his little walk? Mm -hmm. The that red ball. Uh, that doll. doll. Oh, the doll. Oh, the baby yeah. doll. Yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> out of the waters like a baby doll. Yeah. He yeah. also sees the lady in the red coat too when he's running around mm -hmm. when he goes to find the sisters at the police station. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, on a rewatch, it's like uh, the scene where he kind of um, you know puts Laura on the boat and she leaves is super sad because that's like the last time that they are together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. early. There's still so much more film to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he also looks like Willy Wonka. During that scene, <laughs> just the way he's dressed, I don't know. He just looks exactly like him. <laughs> and the music that plays during this reminded me a lot of A Tale of Two Sisters, which I got stuck on because I was like, this is also a tale of two sisters. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but you're weird sisters. This is the color red, not green. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this color means this, and this color means that. <laughs> Trust me, guys. Oh, I believe you. <laughs> Um. So it's a there's a great scene when John is in the police station and he's oh, yeah. got a, a visual description of the two sisters and the police sketch <laughs> artists have drawn the two sisters and he takes them to the police inspector <laughs> and we see the police inspector 
dr- taking notes or something as John is relating the whole story about his wife being gone. <laughs> He's just doodling on the police sketches. <laughs> yeah, that guy was very casual. And John did not sound very put together talking about no. the right. happenings anyway. Yeah. It was a funny little scene. It was such an odd scene. It was a funny little scene. And the police inspector was so odd, too. Yeah. Man. Yeah, there's a bunch of really weird details here. Um Earlier, when the body's being pulled out of the water, the bishop says he hopes it's not another murder. That's weird. It, like, it, what does it matter? It's a dead person getting pulled out of it. It doesn't matter how they got there. Right. Mm-hmm. But it could be a serial killer, though, because the other body. It's not better to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think an accidental death versus a, a potential serial killer. Uh, All right. A lot of people get to, getting to see that, too. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's like that's probably like the most people we see on the streets. You're yeah. right at that point. Also, it, why do you have school groups of children lined up to watch this <laughs> naked lady get drugged out of the uh, the river yeah. dead? Gotta, gotta learn somehow. Yeah, yeah. Are they they're all their, there in their little red caps. They're on their way to story hour. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, <laughs> time for a little forensic science, guys. Yeah, what happened right. on your way to school today? <laughs> Um, when the body's pulled out of the water, we also hear the sisters laughing again, and he imagines himself falling from the rope. Like, there's a shot of him falling to the ground, even That's though that right. didn't actually happen. Oh, there's a, when he's falling off the scaffolding earlier, there's a weird misplaced, you see a reference to one of the sisters laughing while he's falling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like right. a circle shape, the, the, the way they impose that image onto, mm-hmm. so it was almost like they were laughing at him. Yeah. Yeah, they could all, they almost deserve their Wendy's own space. spin-off show. <laughs> mm-hmm. The two weird sisters. Of them like, just laughing. <laughs> 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 they really added a nice creepy Sorry. element because you don't know enough. You don't, they're very mysterious. I right. immediately, every time I saw them, I assumed that they were up to something bad. Yeah, it was very, very dark. I mean, who laughs like this in real life? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, that doesn't happen. Right. If you're normal. Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. For me, the the sisters and the stuff that happens later, it just reminded me of, of course, I'm going to say David Lynch and sort of that lost highway and the mystery man, like that, that freakiness of just like that tension. And it's like, oh, just thinking everybody's just like weird and doing bad things. Yeah. It reminded me of David Lynch, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. so many scenes. Yeah. Just the darkness and the confusion and the interesting timeline of just not knowing what's going on, but you don't care because you're just in it and it's beautiful. Um, We also, uh, John sees what we learn is like a premonition of Laura on the funeral boat. I got so stuck on, um, at the end, Johnny's with them. So I kept trying to see like, because that would be such a big clue for like timeline wise for him if his son was there because like why how would he have gotten from England to Italy so fast but the camera perfectly obscures it the entire time where you can't see the front of the boat um mm-hmm. there's always something covering it or they cut right before you would have seen if he was standing there or not mm-hmm. and then we also see Laura with that same hat earlier there's some weird flashback to them i think they're parked in front of their old house like their house in England and they're driving away and she has the exact same hat on. Mm. Mm. So it's all jumbled up. It's all mixed up. Is that the shot in the rain? Mm-hmm. Right. And they pull away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're coming to the end of the movie and we see that Laura has returned to Venice and she's on her way looking for John. John is with one of the sisters, the blind one, and John is leading her back from the police station, apologetically saying, sorry, I had you arrested. <laughs> My and, bad. <laughs> right. Thought you're being going, weird. <laughs> she's going to join her other sister. And at some, oh, right, what happens is John gets the two sisters tucked in the sister with second sight <laughs> starts to have a seizure. Heather. Right. Right. Heather has a seizure and she gets a vision that John is in imminent danger. Mm-hmm. Laura shows up at the two sisters' house and the sisters send her out desperately looking for John. So John starts to see this strange little cloaked red figure. 
that looks so much like Christine mm-hmm. wearing her little red Mac. And John is chasing her around, chasing this figure around, and finally goes into a little courtyard, closes the gate, and John sees the figure up kind of in a bell tower, I think it is. Mm-hmm. It seems it's not something like that. Yeah, not quite clear. But no it, point is it clear where you are in this in this scene, it's, right? Which is disorienting and great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And as John uh, confronts this little figure, the figure still has uh, their their back to us and to John. And then the figure turns around. Well, of course, it's not Christine, but it's a strange little dwarf who takes a knife out and slashes John in the neck Mm -hmm. and we see him die uh, bleeding out and we see his legs kicking and it's a pretty graphic gory scene and that's not the end end of the movie but I'm wondering if anyone has any other comments oh yeah (laughs) I love that Heather says we're almost there and John answers yes because like uh, we're also towards the end of mm-hmm. the movie but also his life. Like I just think that's such an interesting little turn mm-hmm. of phrase. Yeah, I mean this is where they – I mean that montage where they show you all – they basically paste every cool little thing that they've referenced all together into one continuous thing – and this this was the part that made me want to watch the movie again, mm-hmm. um, like really badly, um, because there's so much of it that I missed. There's and then there's so much. There's so many things that they show you deliberately that you start to think, okay, well that's going to be important, and I have to pay attention to that, like the brooch, and that really ultimately doesn't end up meaning yeah. anything. Mm-hmm. Um, or Chris or Laura tucking the pill into her cuff. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like a bunch of red herrings. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't right. mean anything, but it also speaks to like her state of mind and our husband's trying to help her and she mm-hmm. is not letting him. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's just a quick little informative mm-hmm. bit. That I forgot about that. Yeah. That doesn't have to come into play later on. Right. Mm-hmm. But no, that montage scene was just, it was beautiful and like horrible and just wonderful to watch because it was long. Mm-hmm. And that's like his death scene and he's seeing all of these things. Mm-hmm. And for me, like when he was chasing the red coat, to me, I don't know if he was necessarily chasing Christine, but I think he felt like there was a another small child in a red jacket that was like in distress or that he was trying to like help them or something or he, it was pulling him somewhere that he needed to go. Mm-hmm. Like he was trying to be helpful or to stop this person from hurting themselves and dying like his daughter did. I don't know. But then when the when the face turned around, like when I first watched this movie the first time, like I had no idea what was going to be on the other side of that face. And so when you finally see it, and this is where like the mystery man kind of thing popped up from the Lost Highway, you, it's, and in the in the credits, the, this person is just listed as the dwarf. That's like yeah. the, char- <clears throat> the character. And then she just like slashes his neck and just immediately just like blood and gurgling. But his little seizure spasm thing he was doing, that was a little, that didn't fit. To me, that seemed like that's not what would be happening. If that felt a little over the if top. If your legis- but, throat was just slashed. Um, but it gave you that time for, but maybe too also it was mimicking when Heather was having the seizure in the hotel mm-hmm. and her sister put her hand inside of her mouth. Oh, yeah, don't weird. do that. Why, no. why did Listeners, she do that? Yeah. Because she doesn't know to put something wood yeah. or something. Anyway, like yeah, don't, don't put your fingers do that Don't do all. any no. of those yeah. things. <laughs> Just um, let them be and call an don't ambulance. Don't put your hand in the... Don't no, that was a water really, ambulance. That was a really to. cool scene. <laughs> right. I really liked that scene a lot. The death scene was just so good and that reveal of the red cloaked person. Mm-hmm. Also, it was just like... It was just creepy. It was just really good. Yeah. yeah. Like the creepiest part of this whole movie is that sense of like inevitability and that you're sort of like on a track that you can't stop like there's only one direction and you can't uh make any like there's nothing to do you're Mm -hmm. just stuck and he doesn't know it until the very end Mm -hmm. and it sucks because there's so many clues where like had he known that he has second sight or like had he maybe believed a little sooner or if laura had been back a little faster or uh, the other thing i think about is for me this kind of calls into question wendy's uh intentions because Heather seems to be trying to save John the entire time. She warns him a bunch. He doesn't listen to her. Like, she's done what she can do. 
She tells Wendy to go look for him. Wendy runs downstairs. She barely does anything. Then she sees Laura. And instead of passing along that message of, like, go find him, she brings him upstairs. And I wonder, like, is that the time that, like, had she gone to look for him, could she have saved him mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. intercepted in some way? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it they makes run me... and they get there. But again, he locked the gate. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Truly sealing his fate at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. Uh Yeah. But I too, I feel like John, he, whether he recognizes any of this is happening, he's more intent on helping his wife and saving his wife than doing anything for himself. Mm -hmm. Like he doesn't think he, that anything's wrong with him. Like he's, he's done. I don't know. Mm. I also love um, when that lady turns around and he's like, wait, wait. Wait, and she shakes her head and then, yeah, <laughs> awesome. I yep. want to invite that lady to my next party. I like how she just pulls the knife out of her pocket to really just like that shot of the pocket. Right. Yeah. <laughs> very, very smooth. And I like all of the little like intercut flashbacks. I wrote down all of them, but it would take me probably 20 minutes to read through them. But I think it's interesting because one, it feels like, you know, your life flashing before your eyes. But it also makes me think like, is this time resetting itself? And now we're like back up to the present and things can progress in a linear fashion from here. Like, Mm. I don't know. Just interesting. Pretty much does, though. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like it's like time has been all screwed up the whole time and now it's like righted itself yeah. with his What's interesting demise. too is thinking about how twisted the time is in this movie. It's never jarring and you're never concentrating on, oh, what, usually if I read a book that goes back and forth or watch a movie that's back and forth, my part of my brain of watching the movie or I spend time thinking about the timeline in here, I just don't. It's like you're lost yep. in a little dreamscape of just putting together it's more like puzzle place puzzle pieces being out of order Mm -hmm. and they're slowly like shifting back into space in this like dreamlike sort of way Mm -hmm. i just think that's so effective it's so well done where you're not focused on that that's just amazing storytelling that's a good point at no i don't i don't think there was a single second where i was trying to figure out when we were no you know yeah I hadn't thought about that until right well, now. Now that you say the Allison, this is the point where you do go for with linear. But again, watching it, you're not thinking about it. But now that we're thinking about it and talking about it, it is because now you see the reality of like the funeral boat and what, what John was seeing earlier. And I think that makes it even mm-hmm. more depressing because yeah, it's I like just really everything sad. is faded. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, even John being warned in advance that he's got to leave Venice or else he may die. That had no effect on anything. And then... Several other things happen to that should jar him and shake him up to leave Venice. That doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, when the little red figure turns around in the bell tower, I was thinking of the scene in Mulholland Drive where there's a monster behind the dumpster. And there is such a setup in the diner where the, this guy's meeting with his therapist. And it gets creepier and creepier. And then they go out to look behind the dumpster. And it was one of the scariest David Lynch scenes for me. Oh, it's on um, Bravo, I think, has like a hundred scariest movie moments. Oh. And that's on there. It's the only reason I know. Have huh. you seen it? No, I've I haven't never seen, seen it. it Jeez, now I feel terrible. No, no. no it, the, that's the other part yeah. I know about. <laughs> I don't think many David Lynch movies are on Allison's list of to be watched. Or are they? <laughs> no. I, I when they are, let me the know. Head. Yeah. 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 Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I panic all the time in real life. I don't need to watch a movie where they lead me through that experience. I'm fine. <laughs> well, too, I mean, and I am not a huge Alfred Hitchcock person. Like, those are not like Ooh, the, the, old, the older horror movies that I'm attracted to. Mm. But there's a lot of parallel with the timelines of like this and Hitchcock and the birds and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Wasn't the birds the same? author yeah well there's a few the things short that stories that came from like Rebecca too. yeah yep. yeah i just thought that and i only know that because i read about it like really briefly before which i just think that's cool mm-hmm. i love the birds and i also recently got dive bombed by a robin which reignited that fear you <laughs> don't get too close to the nest <laughs> yeah well they built that fucking nest on my back door so yeah. oh yeah yeah thanks thanks yep. robin I'll, you can borrow Hildy. Hildy kills birds. Oh, yeah. yeah she's a little Great. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I say every time. Great. 
Well, we do have to talk about Casino Royale because which one? The not the nineteen sixty seven Daniel one. Craig one, <laughs> the, right? The, the good one, 2000, the two thousand six one, <laughs> not the one with infinite bonds, including Woody Allen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did, you know Woody Allen was in that one. Nope. Oh, okay. Uh... <laughs> Well, it makes a lot of sense because he has the physique to match that <laughs> That's character. That's right. <laughs> so the way that John is is chasing that little red figure through the, the night maze of Venice is echoed in Casino Royale 2006. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because oh. James Bond is chasing Vesper through Venice. Towards the end of the movie. She's uh-huh. wearing a red dress. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, and it's all done on mm. purpose. It's all in a, Venice. There's yep. like, yeah, it's, it, yeah. It's much more explosive, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, yeah. And there's some buildings that sink in it. That's but, right, yeah. Wow. yeah. But yeah, it's, yeah. There, so, are a, there are a whole bunch of movies that have references to things from this, and mm-hmm. watching watching this not knowing that, it was interesting to spot some of them, um, because you know that one really stuck out for me though. That was that that one's the most on the nose, right? Um, yeah, and it's cool that they took the time to pay tribute to this movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think Julie Christie was really ahead of her time because she came out and she said she was uncomfortable uh, villainizing someone who had a deformity. Mm-hmm. And I thought, man, this is um, you know. A long time ago, she was thinking about that, so I give her credit for mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. So definitely, yeah. It's also funny to me because, like, um, I danced growing up, so maybe this isn't like what normal people think about. But um, if you watch people walk or dance for a while, everyone has their own little physicality, and you can tell, like, even if you can't see their face, like, oh, that's Sarah, because this is the way that Sarah moves. Wouldn't you think that you'd be able to tell, like, your own daughter from a four foot tall woman, like, who is fully grown, like, yeah. looks like they're in their 40s? Like, right. there's no difference. Yeah. You can't. They yeah. were kind of. So the red cloak figure was definitely hobbling around. It yeah. didn't look like a child's movements because right. child's, I feel like, would be more um, dainty or bumbly. This felt like a. They were literally, I just felt like they were hobbling. Mm-hmm. They were, had an interesting gait. Right. It was almost he, he, like he was just drawn to that color. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just see. Well, also, because it's that red cloak, and very early on he sees the red cloaked figure in the church. So when I see this red cloaked figure bopping around town, you know, murdering, but just bopping around town when it was being seen <laughs> by different people, I was picturing the red cloaked person from earlier, mm-hmm. you know? Right. So I, I wanted, like, and was John, was he putting those those pieces together? Like, was he connecting the dots? I think so. Because I think all people look like for unconsciously. patterns. Like, mm-hmm. unconsciously? Yeah. And so, like, I don't know. Like, even, I don't really believe in or fuck with any sort of, like, supernatural stuff. But, like, if my kid Ain't died. Ain't fucking with that. And then... <laughs> Like if a series of events that are so strange keep happening and you keep seeing the same person and your wife is telling you it's Christine, she's with us, like she's like, I don't know that I would believe it, but there would be a little piece of the back of my brain thinking like, maybe, like, mm-hmm. I don't maybe, know. So maybe that's what John is doing at the end is following the, the Christine who he thought his wife saw. I definitely think like, this is my own interpretation, but I think he thought it was Christine. You think you thought it was Christine? Do you think you thought I think it by was? the time he got there, he was like, "That's not Christine." Like when he saw the, like, red, I'm not going to hurt you. And when then, he saw the red cloak yeah. figure in the boats, do you think he was following Christine? In the not boat. that it matters. Maybe on some level, but I think that he was always in doubt that it was Christine. But it was. But after mm-hmm. a while, when you catch a glimpse of the same fucking thing yeah. over and over and over again, you are eventually going to follow it, try to figure out what it is. Mm-hmm. This tells you that maybe you shouldn't, because <laughs> it'll yeah. stab you in the neck. <laughs> also. If someone tells you to leave, mm-hmm. think about it. Yeah. Consider it. He was, and don't he close was, the gate behind you. Yeah. He tried that really, to leave earlier. Yeah. He got on the boat to leave to go join his wife and his son who fell. Yeah. And then he thinks he sees his wife on the funeral boat and he stays. Yeah. Which brings us to the final scene of the movie. She is on a boat with the two sisters. Mm-hmm. And she's... Oh, 
it's not a police boat or an ATM boat this time. It's a funeral boat. Funeral boat. Yeah. <laughs> you know. The specialized yeah. boats That's of what Venice. I wrote it down as <laughs> That's <laughs> right. John so, gets his own boat. And it's cool. It's all black. It's so cool yeah, looking. It is pretty it's cool a looking. It's a, go- it's a goth a boat. boat. I want one. <laughs> <laughs> so John did have a vision earlier when he mm-hmm. saw Laura on the boat. And now she's really on the boat for real. And they are um, going to the church for his funeral. But we see Chris. We boy, all of us want to call her Christine. We see yes. Laura. We see Laura, Julie Christie, and she is almost smiling. She's not crying. Mm-hmm. She is undefeated, as the director has called her, and possibly pregnant. Right. Also, as the director has uh, encouraged people to believe. Mm-hmm. You know what just occurred to me? What? Movie have we seen where the mom is Christine? Oh um, the my bad scene. god! Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> why we are having yeah. so much trouble, right? <laughs> I literally just looked up to see if the little girl's name was Christine. <laughs> right. Hmm. Yeah. See, it's all cyclical. It's right. yeah. <laughs> We're stuck just in our own bunch of strange movie. through lines <laughs> with the movies that we pick. Yeah. At least there weren't any dead birds in yeah. this one. <laughs> also, what color is Christine the car? Oh. <laughs> That's funny. It's not funny. It's stupid. Um, it's fun. It's, it all comes together. It's Yeah. That's right. I like that Johnny's on the boat with a red hat and two red stripes across his sweater or coat. Was and it? then the funeral flowers are also red. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I also really, so you have the death scene where he's lying on the ground, there's blood, he just had all these flashbacks, and when they cut to the next scene with the boat, the funeral boat with them on it, the music is so, like, it's almost, it's uplifting. Yeah. It's the same music from earlier, but it's so uplifting, and you're immediately taken to this, like, moment of, it's still a somber moment, but the music sounds so up. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. Yeah, I think you really have the idea that John and Christine are united again. Mm-hmm. And especially considering that John is more to blame for her death because he's the one who let let Christine play out. Which she so kindly brings up oh, during that yes. little tiff they have. Yeah. Please don't remind me. I already <laughs> trusted you. You let them die. <laughs> yes. Oh. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Laura, for yeah. the memories. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's. I also kind of. I really wish Laura would know about the woman in the red cloak and the things that she was seeing and the premonitions that were being told to her by Heather and what her husband was seeing. I, I want. You're not going to get more information. It does not matter. But I just have. There's so many other burning things I want need to know about. Like at the, her smile at the end of the boat. Like, is she pregnant? Is she mm-hmm. like happy because Christine and John are together? Is she like, hey, I was right. Also, why is she BFF <laughs> the two sisters now? Is nobody else at his funeral? Why are they in the same boat together? Yeah, that's, are they in the same boat? It's the spinoff. I mean, I don't need that, but it's just interesting. Yeah, it is. <laughs> if you want to think about it, the sequel is also like the Omen. It's like now we got the baby. <laughs> Yeah, I thought of the omen several times with this too. Again, I guess it's a kid and there's death, but mm. yeah. are we ready to vote? To vote, I vote. <laughs> Not <laughs> until <laughs> the end of 2024. <laughs> <laughs> er, yeah. yeah, we're gonna do our rankings or ratings. <laughs> <laughs> Who's up first? I'll go first this time. I okay. never go first. Um, I love this movie. I really enjoyed it the first time I watched it. I was so glad that someone picked it for this because I would have picked it eventually. I do think it's a a must-see if you like suspense slash horror, gothic, terror. It fits all of that. Um, I think it's different. It's beautiful. It's so impeccable. I just have so many the acting. And if you're a fan of, I think if you're a fan of film and cinematography and editing, I think it's a really great example for like film people to study, even if you have an aversion to hoarder or um, like blood, there's blood in this, but it's so beautiful. I, I think it should be required. Um, I, I'll give it an eight out of 10. 
I'll give it an eight out of ten. Oh, I realized I was supposed to do my scarometer first, but I, anyways, we're just straight out of the, the gate with this. Um, eight out of ten for the film. Loved it. Highly recommend it. I will watch it again. I think it's something that it's on all of these lists for a reason. Um, and then for the the scarometer, this was more this was more scary to me than some of the other ones we watched. Again, just because of the grief and the the quietness and the foreboding, the unknown and the reality of it. So I maybe I'll, let me see what else did I do? I'll give it, I'll give it a two out of five. I'll give it a two out of five. I think two out of five is scary because it, it was scary. You'd, or, you didn't know what was happening. You had no idea what was going on. It was such a darkness to it. Is it reminding me of that? some of the feelings of some of the mysterious David Lynch stuff that I, I've seen a lot of. So for me, yeah. Oh, in my notes, I gave it a two and a half. Mm. So Allison, put a two and a half for my score. I'll give it a two and a half. <laughs> Updating that now. Yeah. <laughs> so, yep, that's all I got to say about that. Great film. So many amazing things. Lots to talk about and digest. And it, yeah. So it, having listened to this, I hope you have, podcast listener that you have already seen it because we just ruined it for you but if you know anybody else who is into a uh, horror or wants something mysterious you should tell them to watch this movie so as a first time viewer of this uh i'm going to echo that yeah uh hopefully you didn't listen to this all all of this already and get it completely <laughs> spoiled for you because i really liked this movie um I knew almost nothing about it other than that it was very critically acclaimed and considered influential and considered important, um, which has been a theme with our movies lately that we've been selecting. I knew the second the movie was over that I wanted to watch it again because of the way that that last montage played out. I don't think that this movie was particularly scary. Um, I would say I would probably give it a one out of five on the scare meter. The reveal at the end is scary the idea of losing a child is not scary but awful but there is there is this really gloomy feeling to this movie that uh i'm not so much scared by i just love i loved being enveloped in the weird fogginess of mm -hmm. it and the emptiness of venice and i, th I think the two leads in this are just mm -hmm. so good and every and everybody else in venice is confusing but I think that's I think that's by design, yeah. and that just lends more to the atmosphere of the movie. And there are a lot of points where I didn't know what was going on, and I bet that was on purpose. And um, so I so I felt challenged by this movie, but in a good way. Um, and with that said, I think I would also give it an eight out of ten. Um, and I bet that after subsequent viewings, I'd probably give it a mm -hmm. higher score. Than I'm already that. regretting only giving it an eight, but I'm going to go with an eight. Eight's good. <laughs> Eight's really good. You know, and. Yeah, thank you for picking this movie because I've been meaning to watch it for a long time, and I'm I'm glad we did. Yeah, yeah it's a great pick. Um, for my ratings, I'm gonna give it a two out of five for the scare rating. Um, I don't find it super scary, but I love um like the sense of inevitability. Inevitability. I love the sense of inevitability, mm -hmm. and um. Yeah, I, I just, I love that. A lot of my favorite movies, um, like I really love Hereditary, I love um, Lake Mungo, they kind of deal with that uh, theme. Um, and for the movie rating, I'm probably, I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. I really like this movie. I like that every time I watch it, there's something new to think about or talk about or some little thing that I didn't pick up on the first time. Um, I think it has really good atmosphere. Like you said, it's like foggy and dreary and just sort of weird and unsettling. Um, and I like the themes and the like recurring motifs, like seeing the water, reflections being such a big thing. Um, and I think there's a lot of good like thematic elements. I think it's interesting that John is like trying to recreate um, or like uh, restore Mm -hmm. that church and so I thought a lot about like well the can you because it's never going to be the same like it's going to be some sort of like cheap replication um yeah just a lot of interesting things to kind of think about and process so 
nine out of 10 for me. Great. Well, I love this movie too. And, um, there's, there's so much, there are so many interesting parts to talk about and think about. And when you're viewing it, uh, the first scene is just wonderful in and of itself. I think that just stands alone as such a, a great shot in, in really in film history. Also, I love that for a dark kind of horrorish movie, the lighting is occasionally dark, yet everything is still totally viewable because there's a lot of contrast. I really don't like horror movies where you are straining your eyes desperately to see what's going on mm -hmm. because it's just a night shoot mm -hmm. and you can't see a single thing. Every shot in this, I think, is totally viewable, even at night. Mm -hmm. So They I, did a lot of natural lighting for things, too. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I totally appreciate that in a, in a dark kind of horror movie. Um, it's also pretty grim and scary for all the reasons you've said. You know, John really cannot escape his fate as it almost seems to be closing in on him, which is such a terrible, wonderful feeling. And the scaffolding scene mm -hmm. is great. I just love that. And it that scene also looks like it was really filmed in the 70s. It's just the, <laughs> the way it's shot, the camera angle, the crashing glass. It's uh, the slow motion. The, the slow motion, exactly. It's, it's, it's wonderful. So I'm going to give it an 8 on the movie rating and a 2 on the scarometer. Well, thank you for listening to this episode. We hope you've had a great time with it. If you like what you heard today and want to let us know, you can email us at whatscaresus at aadl.org. Thanks for joining us. This has been What Scares Us. What Scares Us.